So I got kicked out of college pre-Christ. And so university was never something that I was interested in. I was doing whatever I could to make money. So I started working for DPD. I'm not archaic. But I'm looking at the current Gen Zs and saying they didn't play Knockdown Ginger the way we did. Mm, right. They didn't climb trees the way we did. All they know is their iPad and they are so... It's, it's fixed. It, they're, they're fixed. They don't know how to break out of it. And, and social media is feeding them information. They don't know how to think for themselves. And we're going in that way already. And now AI's popped up. But... I, I see it very much that our essence never changes. We are always going to be sort of creative beings. And in the same way when, um, for example, Adobe first came out with certain tools that would help you be able to do graphics and things like that a lot easier, um, people, you know, artists and various um, people felt like they were going to lose their edge and mm. so on and so forth. But what humans always find a way to enhance it and take it to to an, a, another mm. level. The whole point of church is connection. Mm. Yeah, it's relationship. Yeah. It's by the love we have for one another. That's how God is seen. And I think the moment that you shift it and bring bots into that, you break the relational aspect because I don't know how much relationship I can have with a robot. Mm. It has a soul. You see? But I know how much relationship I can have with a human being. And the whole point of church is God created us in his image so that we reflect relationship and the way we relate with one another signifies who God is. It's a, sim it's a symbol of who God is. And I think the moment we implement robots to do God's work mm. is the moment we've lost what the church is about. And I think that is problematic. Welcome to another Business of Church podcast. My name is Corey Belfort. There's Stuart, as you know. And we are blessed to have Omar Taki here from Act 2.0 Church. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you for having me. Applause. Applause. Coming down. Thank you for having me. Um, so is, this is, this is a, an informal gathering. It's like yeah. I was saying earlier. It's a fly on the wall yeah. and we're just here talking. Um, we know that you are uh, an inspirational character. Your journey, things that you've been through and the transformation, I think, that you've um, accomplished. And I think the lives that you affect in general. Um, but we always like to try and start as early as you would like in mm. your journey. You know, I'm happy to, you know, we all have our moments in our life when we transition or we... Um, we, we take that fork in the road. So right. when, when would your sort of key moment in your life? My key moment in my life. So hi everyone. Um, my key moment in my life was 2016 at the age of 23. Um, I had an encounter with God um, that I think changed the rest of my life permanently. Um, I didn't grow up Christian, so I didn't grow up in a Christian background. I didn't go Sunday school, never read a scripture. Um, became an atheist in my teenage years due to a lot of the trauma and hardship that I'd seen. And yeah, it kind of just, it rocked my world, what I'd seen in earth. Um, it made me question God and if God was actually real. And I think I suppressed his existence in order to live okay to justify my immorality in a sense I, I had to justify god's not being real mm. and so at the age of age of 23 and 2016 i had this real encounter with him um so just suicidal not really wanting to be on earth anymore due to couple situations and i experienced life i should say um god touched me in a way that basically ripped me out of that suicidal mindset gave me life and i think from then my life has just been seen as you saved me and i should really be dead my life is yours and so that's what gave me i guess the fuel and that was my transitioning moment in life that gave me the fuel to be who he's made me to be today where did that where where, where, where did that happen was that was you invited to like a prayer meeting yeah. you to sort of like a church service i have the feeling it was a lot more dramatic <laughs> it wasn't that, it wasn't do you know what the answer is I actually got invited to a church so my first time I ever stepped into a church okay. now mind you I would have never stepped into a church it had to be someone who was special that could get me through those doors female female <laughs> but it was my cousin it wasn't before anyone gets any ideas it was my cousin so this cousin of mine um to me very inspirational she had a, a procedure where both her arms and legs were cut off so she um right now is one of the most 
impactful inspirational people that i know she drives she has her own house she's renovating it. it's crazy like she's just incredible but she went to a church service and if she can worship god despite the things she's faced in her life who am i you know so she's phoned me i'm thinking about you know taking my life and she phones me and says come to church this preaching's for you and i'm like you know what i'll take you up on that so i walk into a service and here's what's interesting i walk into that service and i see people laughing joking smiling my context is if you laugh and joke you're weak now do you know how crazy that is that i can see people enjoying life with no restriction and that's what's drawing me closer to god because i want that yeah yeah imagine that life is so serious for you. you know what i'm saying yeah. like you picture we're in house parties we just stand on the wall because we don't want to dance because dancing's silly yeah 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 like yeah, that's yeah. how bound and and shut up i was in that yeah. you know what i'm saying and then i come and i see people look, and i'm just like i want that freedom yeah and it wasn't even the message yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that like life <laughs> spirit you know it like, was that you know, like the world's on your shoulders Do you see what i'm saying yeah, yeah. and so he he i don't know what he preached bro i went up i gave my life but i was questioning it next week i came into their service they had a one service where all their branches were together and again i'm seeing so many young people jump in praise and i'm thinking they're crazy that are them but it's a culture shock to me mm-hmm. and then he preaches the gospel mm-hmm. and i hear this message about jesus and i just ask you know what if you're real show me mm-hmm. and i walked out of that church service and like a decade worth of wickedness just darkness gone I'd forgiven everybody. Okay. I'd let go of everything and I just felt new. Mm. I, I, bro, and that's why I tell you, it was such a real experience for me because I know what suicidal thoughts are like. Mm. I know what depression's like. I know what, like, even paranoia, like to that deep degree where mm. grudges, bitterness, I know what all that's like. And bro, I came out and all of a sudden it was like- In that moment. In that moment, as soon as I walked outside, After it was gone. Service. Off, finished. Okay. And I've never read a scripture before to know what happened to me. Yeah. I didn't know what happened. I was just like, why is this? What is this? Mm. That's what made me throw myself into the Bible to find out what happened to me. Just tell me, you, you, you walked out of that service. Obviously, you, you still have a connection with people that you would have had connection yeah, yeah, yeah. with anyway. Yeah. You just felt different to all I them. felt different. Interestingly, I came home, my ex, so my then girlfriend was in bed. Um, I remember coming to the house and long story short, I basically got her a drink. So she was trying to do something manipulative. I got a drink. I came upstairs. The first thing I said to her was, I don't have sex no more. Mm. No one preached anything to me about that, you know. Yeah. I felt so pure inside me. You need to keep that purity. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm trying to show it. something happened yeah. in that yeah. service yeah, 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 that yeah. changed me completely. I mean, the thing I'm looking, I'm thinking, I'm visualizing all this happening and I'm thinking to myself, when you go back into your environment, mm. people are going to be saying, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, you're going to yeah. get so many people yeah. asking what are you about, what are you talking about? Even yeah. when people go on a diet, it's like, mm, come on, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what what was that like? So it was a struggle at first. Well, at first I think people were happy because they could see I was peaceful. Yeah. You know, so at first they were applauding it. Oh, Omar's, you know, this is the right move for him, etc. And then eventually I think it started to get on people's nerves. <laughs> um, but I think I, I realized when it started to shift that way. I remember coming to one of my friend's houses and he was going out to sell drugs. He was going to go basically bust a shot. You got righteous on him. And I got righteous on him. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, bro, do you realize what this is doing to... And he was like, bro, you were doing this two weeks ago. You But I think I started to, um, oh, in a way, step on toes. Yeah, yeah. So when I walk in the room, it's like, oh, Omar's here. Stop swearing. Like, uh, yeah, and I was yeah, just like, yeah. guys, like, it's cool. Do you know what I mean? But you know, there's that scripture and uh, it, it's, it's a real one, you know. Um, people love darkness instead of light mm-hmm. and didn't come to light because they in fear that they'd be exposed it's like all of a sudden lights come into the room do you know what i'm saying and Mm. i think people don't like the lights being on because it shows all the all the stains and whatnot you know what i mean it's the uv light yeah yeah (laughs) it's not even a light it's a uv (laughs) light it's picking up everything Everything. and people don't want to know they they don't want to know do you know what i'm saying so that was the struggle so i had to have a period of probably about a year to two years where i separated myself from that context Mm -hmm. and my i guess i'm it's fortunate and unfortunate the bible talks about being unequally yoked yeah yeah it's it's hard even though you know like jesus he went amongst yeah. the people to, to you know but yeah. you probably had to take that sabbatical i needed out. to yeah. i needed to and it's almost as if i needed to go away for a little while so it's almost like a boomerang if you could just picture that picture that like i had to come out 
to come back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I needed to complete your transition. You see what I'm saying? Because I know that if I stayed around them, I'd probably be tempted to smoke. I'd probably be tempted to go out and get girls and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? I needed a moment where I could solidify who I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think they understood that. You needed to learn this new you. Yeah. And it went so crazy to say that when I became a believer, I started go going to Christians' houses and I'm just seeing them sit down at tables and eat dinner. That was a big shock to me. I loved that. That I could see family eating with each other, brothers and sisters laughing and whatnot. And I was just like, this is, I love this. And it didn't make me want to go back to where I came from. Mm -hmm. I've, it's a new environment. It was beautiful. And then it comes to a point where, yeah, you do feel solidified and you do feel to make amends and reconcile with the people that you left behind. Yeah. And come back. An obligation to those people because that is often what I see. You know, I have family members that, you know, they're kind of put in two camps. Yeah. You've got the progressive, and then you've got the people who ain't really going to be doing too much, perhaps. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're trying to maintain both. And in a sense, yes, I, I did feel an obligation, but I also had to come to the realization that it's not on my job to save them. Mm. It's not up to me. Mm. Um, and I think I, it weighed heavily on me when I was saying, I think there's this language in church of winning souls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that even the word winning in that statement, if I don't win, it means I'm a failure. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it, it can make you shy away from actually giving people the message because if it doesn't produce results, yeah, yeah. then you feel yeah. bad. Do you know what I'm saying? So I had to realize, I read this scripture one day, which was um, Paul planted, Apollos watered, God is the one who gives the growth. Yeah, yeah. And I realized I'm simply one who just plants. I just water. <laughs> it's not up to me to save you. Mm. You know what I mean? Through my life and through the message that I share with you, if God decides in that moment to do it, then he will do it. Mm. So from then I've just been on a journey of walking alongside them they've been groomsmen at my wedding you know they've it's, it's incredible you find that because you know sometimes trying to mix two environments yeah yeah i've seen i've seen it play out even in my own family where you know what should have been a beautiful day turns out to be a little bit of a nightmare right i think i've been able to find a blend now so I think I am at the place where Jesus can sit with the tax collectors and sinners and it's okay. They're not rubbing off on him. I, I think, but I don't want to put confidence in myself, but I've been okay. And most times that I've been out with my boys, I, I haven't succumbed to whatever it is that they're... I guess also they... Um, now they now respect absolutely like, you're leading absolutely so, so they even hold me accountable yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know like so save you from yourself you yeah, see what yeah, i'm saying yeah, yeah. so we have that respect that mutual respect now um so if they're smoking for example it's like i'm not telling bro if i told them to stop smoking right now are they going heaven anyway <laughs> you know if i told them to stop having sex are they going heaven for stopping to have you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. it's like no whatever righteous deed they do will still be a filthy rag in god's eyes mm -hmm. so it doesn't benefit me saying stop doing this stop doing that if they haven't given their life to christ anyway mm -hmm. so then my thing is to just be alongside them walk alongside them as they you know and then eventually by god's grace yeah, we'll yeah, see that transition yeah, i guess the hope is that they see your life mm -hmm. now you know, the benefit of you yeah. doing what you do yeah. and hopefully that may lead them to yeah. Christ yeah. okay so 23 big change in your life um, you, you, you mentioned uh, you started working um, how did you make the, the transition because we always like to try and have a, a sort of business angle to it I mean mm. for you to be doing what you're doing now What's your current situation? I mean, how did you manage to morph into doing what you're doing right now? Are, are you still working? Or are you still, or are you doing ministry full time? Are you, right. How are you balancing? Your I'm life? full time ministry right now. Right. Um, do you want to know how I got to full time? That, that's that's the transition. Right. So um, it happened, I think, unexpectedly. I, I didn't. So I've never had the ambition of being a pastor or being in full-time ministry if so my context doesn't even i didn't see preachers growing up on my mum's screen church has never been something where i've been like oh that's inspiration i want to get there i mean i've heard my first pastor at 23 or first preacher at 23 so it was never a thing for me but my salvation experience did make me say that i'm giving my life is to this so whatever happens happens so ministry is almost inevitable if you see the path that god set out for me how i got there um it was locked down um lockdown i had just applied for university so i got kicked out of college pre-christ 
And so university was never something that I was interested in. I was doing whatever I could to make money. So I started working for DPD. Now, that was that was insane, bro. Like <laughs> delivering parcels, having to wake up five in the morning, get home 7 p.m. It was sucking the life out of me. I was living at home with my mum. My mum phoned me one day at like six in the morning. She said, enough is enough, apply for university. And I felt that was like probably one of the most important times between me and my mum's relationship because I felt like she gave me some direction and I needed it. So I had a smile on my face when she said that. So I've gone on my phone and I've just applied for this university. No UCAS points, nothing. And I told them my story. I said, listen, I, I, ain't got no, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. I had a criminal record, yada, yada, yada. And I said, but I gave my life to Jesus. Like, I'm done talking. And they go, come in tomorrow, we got an interview. This is October, uni started already. Yeah. I get into university, um, sorry, I go to the interview. They phone me in the evening and say, yeah, you, you got into university. No UCAS points, boom, I'm in. Lockdown comes, I'm still in university. Lockdown lifts now. My pastor, I said to my pastor, because I was getting ready to propose to my wife. And I said to my pastor, when are we going back to church? He said, I don't think we're going back. So I said, all right, cool. We eventually get back to church and um, the church is overrun. Let's just say it's, it holds 400 people. There's about 450, maybe 500 people. And he says, we need to do two services. Omar, are you good to run the second service? <laughs> what, just out of the blue? Or had you been showing signs of... I do that the odd one here and there. No, I, I'd shadowed him. Right. So when I came to church, I wasn't in any ministry. I wasn't ushering. I wasn't in prayer, but I'd float between everything. Like you didn't have to tell me to do anything. I'd just find myself doing it. So I think he trusted me in that respect. So he says he wants me to run the second service. I'm saying, bro, I've never run something in my life. He said, but you've been faithful in another man's work. Yeah. So won't God trust you of your own? I've always been number two. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think that's what gave me, I guess, the confidence to say, okay, what I've experienced coming through my Christian journey should be enough for me to be able to do this. So we start doing the second service. And in the second service, it was supposed to take some of the early morning congregation and split it between the, the PM congregation. But the early morning congregation didn't come. Oh, wow. But do you know what happened? 150 new people came. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, now, how did that happen? Was there some promotion that happened? I, bro, it, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember promoting anything. God did some promotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember promoting anything, yeah. but we had about 150 people come through the doors in our first service and that made put me in the mind of, okay, we need this team, we need that team, we need this, we need that. And the venereal spirit kicked in. Exactly, because, bro, something has to happen. We have to sustain this. Yeah. And so now what's happened is the AM and PM have two different DNAs, two different cultures. It's not that congregation being split between two. It's that congregation and this congregation now. So he says, you may as well be a second service. I'm already doing the work now. So it's, it's like, a, it may as well happen. Yeah. And then I got ordained as a pastor. That's how it happened, bro. So it was like a trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what yeah, I'm saying? It was yeah, yeah, through the back door. It wasn't in my face. It wasn't. This is this is yeah. the steps. It just yeah. happened yeah. organically. It's so beautiful. yeah, it's, it's beautiful. So okay, so you're now. You're, you're, so you're then in that that, that scenario there. Um, Des mentioned earlier, you know, the sort of entrepreneurial spirit. How do you see? Because you know, you said you need this team, that team. Church is one of the things that we often talk about. Is finding additional revenue streams mm. how are you finding the, the 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 financial aspect of running the church and the sort of business aspect mm -hmm. of running the church do you delegate that do you get involved in that how does that play out? so at this present moment in time i think it's interesting it, we had a centralized financial system in that all the money goes to one bank account um so when we first started because it was supposed to be am and pm service it was one account for the one church and I was comfortable with that because they already had their own financial team. They could handle the money coming in, go deposit it in the bank. I didn't have to think about it because they already had a financial team. When it became the own church, I had to split bank accounts. And that's when I had to now get my hands a bit dirty in terms of the finances and, and figure out how we upload the gift aid, the, the, the CIO charity stuff and the audits. And I had to start getting involved in that stuff. Um, it came to a point where we got a building and when we got the building we had to look at our money and say okay have we got enough to do this and we did we had enough for the building so we got the building then it was okay we need to do a fundraising project to renovate this building and we did it we raised the funds to renovate the building we finished the building renovation product just january just gone but i found increased frustration with being the pastor and being over the finances 
Yeah. My mind was being taken in too many directions. We now need to pay for the insurance, the electric bill, the waste management, the permits, uh, the, the insurance tax. This And it's all coming to my email address and I'm getting frustrated. Because yeah. do that which you set out to do. My main thing is to preach, pray, and do direction for the church not to handle the finances so we had to look at the model and say okay what's wrong with the way that we're currently doing it and that's where we appointed deacons so we got deacons now um, and so they handle all of the hall hiring they handle all of the logistical side of the finances um, i'm involved or i'm involved to a small degree because i think that there has to be a very big caution between pastors and the handling of finances so you know, Des's experience, you know, I mean, you can talk about it, Des, but, you know, in terms of often enough you go into a church, you know, the, the, you know, the pastor is like the head of the church, but, you know, doesn't necessarily, like you mentioned a few words, like, you know, almost like dirt in your hands, mm. with getting involved in the finances and so on, but yet it's integral to mm. the survival of mm -hmm. the church. Um, and then it's, you know, how much responsibility do you ultimately divulge to the deacons because mm. you know they start doing some stuff that's <laughs> wrong and then you know eventually it's going to come back on your yeah. back when you turn yeah. up and the doors are locked yeah <laughs> um so the amount that we divulge obviously it's on a consistent and trust basis mm. it's not to everybody it's to one mm. Um, and I think that is stuff in terms of, so we have two ways of giving. We have Church Suite, which is an online app where you can donate via QR code and you have the bank account. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do um, in order for the yearly um, audit is we need to put both bank account and Church Suite donations into one software system so that we can think it. So that involves data protection because we can see who's given their address, etc. I need someone that I can trust with that information to be able to do that. So that's the first bit about divulging information. Um, the second part in terms of a pastor being aware of the finances, I think it's critical and it's key for sustaining a church. You need to know the resources you have in order to be able to move forward. Exactly. You, you yeah. So where I say I don't want to get my hands dirty, I'm talking in the area of the admin around finances. Yeah. But in terms of knowing how much is there, in order to visualize and say we can budget and put that much into this and that much into that that's where my head is because it's directional only right. you see what i'm saying yeah okay well that's 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 good to hear and um and certainly i know desi's ears would have been you know going doo -doo 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 -doo, <laughs> listening to some of the things that you did obviously you know we're in this space ourselves yeah. so um in terms of providing services to churches but yeah so it's it, it's good to hear you say that because um you know i don't know no, 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 take too much of anything, no, no. but you know, a lot of um, a lot of churches and pastors that we speak to and come across, there's this real conflict, and it's almost like, and also one of the, the fundamental things you could probably tell me a little bit about decision making, mm. because one of the problems that sometimes you know you have churches and they have good people around, but nobody wants to the 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 the, the structure is so flat. Um, nobody really wants to take ownership and so making decisions especially mm. financial decisions and so on and so forth it's like it just goes round and round it's just getting batted from one and nobody no decision is getting made right. how do you guys do you have a formalized mm -hmm. process of mm -hmm. making decisions mm -hmm. or do you just ultimately listen to all the information and then make the proclaimer right so we have we're a charity so we have trustees trustees are ultimately responsible for the decision making because it will come back on them wow. um, <laughs> they're ultimately um yeah they're responsible i should say for whatever happens to the organization but the elders or the pastors are spiritually responsible so we have the governance in sense of the direction but before we can actually say this is a thing that we can do we have to go through the trustees mm -hmm. in order to make that so that's our structural basis um i How think you appoint those trustees because so, sometimes people just right. and um, so there is an interview process oh, wow. yeah there is an interview process for the trustees um, the, it, it will be sent out via email mm -hmm. if someone's interested as a trustee and I think they have to be involved in other organisations so whether it be um, ones like a solicitor a lawyer etc different business mm -hmm. backgrounds These things stipulated in the church's governing document which is basically the, the, the document that underpins the charity one is legal form and two, how the charity will act. 
So in that governing document, I would assume these things are in there as to how you appoint trustees typically. I believe so. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I don't know by document because I'm coming into a church um, branch. So I'm a branch of a church. Right, okay. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's not me, just the one. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole organization I'm a part of. Right, okay. So off the top of my head, I can tell you this is how it's done. In terms of document, I can't tell you that. Yeah, yeah. But I do know there is a document. I just don't know no, if I it's in there. I guarantee there's definitely one in the fact yeah. that you're, you're quoting procedure. <laughs> yeah. tell me that that some things are well documented yeah 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 so, yeah. It's probably there. yeah so that's that's the process right sounds good yeah. really, really impressive so okay so you you, you you've you gone on this journey you, you you tell me a little bit about um some of the challenges some of the things that you you know you, every week mm -hmm. people are coming to your church and you're 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 touching souls or you you may you may not um What's that like? What's it? What's the pressure for somebody like yourself, your your age? Now, how old are you now? I'm turning thirty one next week. <laughs> you know that. That's got to be a lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably turning about fifty. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. The young, 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 young. Good genes, bro. Come on. Right, so, so, buy them. So, so, you know what, what? What's it like for you? I mean, it's about really what I'm saying is is there's the there's the person and the persona. Yeah. Of Omar. Yeah. But, you know, what's it like behind, you know, is there that imposter syndrome? It's still lurking. Is there... I've got you. It's lonely. Mm. Um, you have to show up even when you don't want to show up. Mm. That's difficult. Especially when um, you see so many people with the privilege to quit because they want to. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you don't have that privilege. So being a leader is is definitely um, it shaped my character in a sense. It's given me more resilience when I don't feel like doing that. I still need to. Um, so there's that. Um, there's also, and this goes back to church governance. I am one elder, one pastor over four hundred. I don't like that model. When I look at the Bible and I look at how churches are run, you'd see they appointed elders, leaders, not one man of God. Because I think that one man of God does create a God complex in the in the person. And I think this stuff has to be distributed amongst many that I can carry this burden with a team as opposed to me being seen as the yeah. I am that I am, which I'm not. So because the church is set up that way, I do find those situations where people be like, oh, pastor didn't speak to me today. But there are deacons. There are other leaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because of the way it's set up, I am seen as this... And I can't meet everyone's expectations. I can't meet everyone's needs. It's too much pressure for one person to handle. You see what I'm saying? So that's, that's where I'm currently building the structure in a sense that I'm raising up other pastors, elders that can stand alongside me to carry it. They may not preach like me. You know, they may not do certain things like me, but they will carry the same authority as me. And I have to put it in these same men that I'm raising up that they carry as much weight as I would carry in terms of governing this church. You know what I'm saying? So that's, I guess, as a pastor, if there's a couple things I could mention, I'd say this, for example, there's, a, there's this rule called the 50% rule. If someone has a problem with the pastor, they can share it with everybody. But the pastor can't share their part otherwise the pastor looks like a monster you know what i mean so it's like people can always bite at me i can't bite back otherwise i'm a madman you know yeah, 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 yeah. so you have to hold accusation when it may not be warranted you have to um also have people's projections of other pastors they come in and they project what the other the last one did yeah. already on yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah, yeah. so there's so many pressures that and if you're successful as well then you have the pressure from other churches looking at yours and competing and it's just i mean i was going to say you know um you being a, a relatively new and young pastor mm. as a pastor in your local branch have you found it probably a hard question to answer yeah. but but no, just just some sort of conflict maybe the way you do like you said there are two cultures in the church that you you know when you did the morning session and yeah it was, a, it was like two separate cultures. Yeah. One's just, hey, these guys have just come in from there. Yeah. They, they might be guys who I can actually associate with. I understand what they're going through. Mm -hmm. you know, there's many a pastor who they've had a God path since then. Like, for instance, me, I was born in church. Right. My mum's a, uh, a bishop now, mm -hmm. a pastor. Wow. I mean, I grew up with the, I don't know, redemption songs or yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever it was. You know, I didn't know a life outside of church. Mm. 
I have to go and find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're, so okay. <laughs> that's where he came in. <laughs> okay. You know, so there are those, and, I, and there are friends of mine who are now pastors who have never seen a day outside of church. Right. So they grew up on that. Part. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you were saying, you know, there was two two cultures, mm. if you like. Did you find, you know, maybe not between you and the, the, the current church, but maybe ministers around and other ministers outside that who've seen you just like, you're just like two minutes in the job and, you're doing this well, what's all that about I heard it um, through the grapevine mm. nothing was ever said to my face yeah. but I've heard things mm. and um, that's very difficult to deal with you know it, it almost alters how I view people now because I hear things behind the scenes yeah. from so, a set of people that you would never expect them you know from. Yeah. and that makes it difficult and, and I think also social media as well I struggle with social media mm. um yeah, I really struggle. From what? From, from the, the personal side or from the... Um... I think it's self-promotion. This is me. This is Omar now. This is yeah, Omar. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, this is me. This is my grab. This is my conviction. Yeah. I am personally, due to my experience, my only interest is seeing people give their life. I don't care whether my name's in bright lights. I don't care anything about my name. Like... I care if people are being saved, etc. But then there's that struggle where you wonder if people are doing it for their own name. And that's where I get a bit funny and I don't know if I can really blend with that. This is me, you know. Right. So, so let me just try to understand what you're saying there. So I could understand when you say where, where your main interest lies. Uh, are you saying that you fo you're conflicted with sort of promoting yourself out there um, so that is, you know, like taking photos and, you know, doing all of that sort of... I struggle with self-promotion. Right, okay. This is me as Omar. Because yeah. now, look, if I write a book, I have to promote. Mm -hmm. You know, if I do a podcast, I have to promote. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? There's just certain parts where I think it's me guarding my heart. I, I, I think, I, I'm not sure, it, there's promoting for the right reason. Yeah. So you're trying to extend... The, the 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 word absolutely gospel, going out absolutely because that's what we're supposed to absolutely. do absolutely gospel but you know and we've spoken about it before where there are some ministers who actually come into it for their own notoriety that's where my conflict is yeah. so it's not the first it's the latter yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. and I think it's being able to discern the difference are you worried that other people think because within yourself you you know you, who you are know. you must yeah. know you said who you are, yeah. where your preference lies. But do you worry that other people see you from the outside looking in and think, bigging oh, himself up? I don't, I don't, I don't, if I'll be honest, mm. I don't really worry what people think. Mm. I think this is more of a personal thing for me. Mm. It's where would I go if I started that journey? Oh, I see. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so. How far or how deep could it take me in terms of me puffing myself up? Right. Do you get? Yeah, so you don't want to sort of almost like forgive the terminology but you know stoke the demon basically you know. basically right. if there's a little bit of, in me that needs some sense of validation mm -hmm. and i start getting that how far would i go with that yeah. you know and it's like i don't almost want to step into that to find out so this is a me problem yeah. Yeah. this is no one else yeah, no, Prayer, no. Bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. this is a me thing and i'll be completely vulnerable and honest yeah. with it because yeah. i know myself yeah, yeah, yeah you know what i'm saying so what might be okay for another person i try to put as many guards in pot in in place yeah, so that i you know what yeah, i'm saying yeah, I respect, yeah. hopefully, hopefully yeah. exactly i yeah, hope I hopefully the, the the deacon group that you're trying to build mm. would help keep you in check i believe so yeah. we've spoken and, about and, this and, there you go you <laughs> we've spoken about, about it yeah guard you. Yeah, yeah we've right spoken about it stuff. so that that's why i say it's a me thing yeah. This is nothing with any anyone not being able to promote anything because I'm aware I would need to promote at some point in order to because I'll, I'll even say this I know pastoring in terms of a salary is not going to do anything for my family moving forward mm. you know like yeah, yeah. I need to be able to think of other means of income yeah. in order to keep my family okay and well sustained which then means that I'm going to have to do something yeah that may involve maybe books and royalties or even honorariums and speaking engagements, etc. that does put me in a platform and in a light. Mm. What I'm currently facing in this period of my life is that validation thing, which I think could be something where you said imposter syndrome, could be something where I need to check. And that's why I say, I, where you said prayer, I completely agree. Mm. So me and my wife have had these conversations about what does that look like? And I'll tell her, this is me as Omar. 
you know, I feel this way towards self-promotion and she completely understands it. So I'm just on a journey, but I know I'm going to get there. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. One question that we're asking of late is, what's, and, and this is particularly um, interesting because you're, a, you're a, a young person who's, who, I think saying young like you're you, but, you're, <laughs> but, um, but just AI in... in oh, gosh. Jeez. <laughs> I'm a technologist. Wow, you know, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know me. You went it's there, the bro. Philosophy and this, that, the other. You went, hey, I, okay. <laughs> I told you talk before, to me. man. He'll Jeez, take you there. bro. Okay, let's talk. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's yeah, do it. yeah, yeah. No, mm. I mean, it, you know, because it's really, I mean I, I, I mean, I understand it from a technology point of view, how it works, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I'm okay with the fact that if, if, if you were researching stuff, yeah. you know, and using chat GPT to research, you know, sermons and so on and so forth, it's no different from you reading through millions of books and right. doing the research. It's just doing it on your behalf. Right. Uh, but what's your sort of, I don't know if you've thought about it, whether you utilize it, how you feel about it, you know. <laughs> It's so interesting. No, no, I promise you, I've not touched it once. Really? I, um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, mm. but I... But you've got a conspiracy. you got a conspiracy. I have, I, I, I have a little, right. you know, like a little uh, guilty pleasure right. with looking into that kind of stuff and trying to figure out what does it mean for life in the future. Yeah. And so ChatGBT, I haven't touched it once. Mm. Um... I think AI in terms of it as uh, moving forward in the world as a progressive thing, I think it's great, but I think it has serious, serious, serious societal, societal. In, yeah. People aren't going to study for themselves anymore. You know, we're going to be relying on robots to give us all the information that we need. And then eventually I think that stuff can start to give you false information and you'll believe it. I mean, that, yeah, that, I mean, that happens at the moment. I mean, that's one of the guardrail things yeah, that yeah. they're trying to, to resolve is, you know, it, hallucinations and things like mm. that. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting that, that for me, I see it as an, an enabler. Mm. So, you know, my objective is X, like your objective is to, you know, save souls uh, 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 and so on. Um, now, if something empowers you to be able to do that, and you're able to be that much more efficient in doing that. Is that is that a bad thing? And it's like anything, any technology, anything that comes into this world, if it's used for bad, it's usually man that's, that's used it for bad. Absolutely, that's using it for bad, and so on. So it's like anything. It's like I was saying to another minister that if you was using ChatGPT and you're you're there with your tablet reading it out verbatim in in you know in your, in your to your congregation. That's a, I got, that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? If you if you have an idea and a spark, and you think you know what, I really want to touch people on that. You know, maybe I need some statistics, or I need some you know insight into that, and you use it as a research tool, and it gives you back, and you sit there, you read it, you think, yeah, and you formulate your ideas, and then you go out. Mm. It's a powerful. Tool. It's, a tool. it's a powerful it's tool. It's, power, it's powerful like the tool. internet. It's like yeah. Google. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. In that's that exactly sense, I think. Said, yeah. yeah. In that sense, I think ChatGPT is incredible. Mm. I think when it when it becomes a, something that we're dependent upon, I think so that's when it becomes societal. Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking long term, not so much. Yeah, that, would, that would almost suggest that the internet was an issue. But and I think the internet still gives you a sense of autonomy. I don't know how far AI. Cool. Yeah. I don't know how far AI like in the internet. I I don't know. I don't see the two as the same. No, I see not, AI yeah. as as completely extremely advanced to what the internet is actually doing Absolutely. so i still go on google to look at commentaries and to look at certain research things but i know that i'm the one that's getting that information and i can look at that source and that source and i can come to my own conclusion on the matter i'm not saying with chat gpt and the internet you can't do that but i think people will focus so much on what chat gpt says that it becomes conclusive AI tools. yeah yeah that, I that becomes the conclusion as opposed to me weighing up different sources and formulating my own I conclusion guess, i guess it's down to yeah i hear you mm. it's down to the person using it yeah. how they're going to use it mm. you know yes. it's a tool in my you know for uh, me okay so so if you're talking societal so that rather than looking at it as individuals the impact on society and i think that's where you're really it's like okay for people who are strong mind and sound mind they know how to use it Absolutely. you know mm. but in general in society what's the overall i mean okay so you mentioned robots you know the the likelihood 
of robots. I mean, China just launched a, an initiative. By 2025, they want to be mass-producing robots. By 2027, I think, quote me, they, they want to be um, impacting the economy significantly and so on and so forth. So the age... Now, some people say that having, you know, humanoid intelligent robots can usher in an age of abundance for everyone because now there is no limit to gdp in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a country right? yeah. you, you know you've got unlimited labor yeah mm -hmm. so that frees us up to do less monotonous less dangerous type work mm -hmm. so in that future potentially um, we have a uh, universal basic income or something like that do you see that as a, as a as a positive outcome to something like this or do you see that as I think there's pros and cons bro <laughs> I think if you if you think about the way that things are currently going people are going to lose jobs now that could be fantastic and that could be bad because then the means of how you earn your income will be dependent upon the government you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's where you become enslaved. enslaved. Mm -hmm. And so I see a massive con in AI taking over jobs currently. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, that's where the creativity in, in, in hum, hu, humanity disappears as well. Yeah. And we are creative beings. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this thing has decided to take over so that we can't be innovative and decide the kind of future that we want because society set it up in such a way that I, it's too rigid. I can't break out of it in order to do what I need to do. So, so I see the con in that sense, but I also see the pro. The issue is I'm thinking about my daughter and her generation. I'm not archaic, but I'm looking at the current Gen Zs and saying they didn't play Knockdown Ginger the way we did. They didn't climb trees the way we did. All they know is their iPad and they are so... It's, it's fixed it, they're, they're fixed They don't know how to Break out of it and, and social media Is feeding them information They don't know how to Think for themselves And we're going in that way Already And now AI's popped up mm. That to me yeah, I guess take you so further really, down so you, see, yeah. you see Ultimately A sort of An indirect A, a voluntary Enslavement Basically Almost um, In the culmination of ai at its apex so rather than so it's more the the, the not so much the terminator where it's you know mm -mm. going around no. killing people but just that people lose agency basically they don't have their own sort of sense of purpose and focus basically every you know what you know i kind of i uh, me personally i see it slightly differently i mm. think that you know there are ways in which you know, the, the, the core essence of humanity is always going to be there. Um, you know, some people think we're just, you know, the, 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 the sort of butterflies, not even a butterfly, but the, the caterpillar building the thing for, and, the cat, and the butterfly is going to be the AI that is going to go and travel the universe, right. not us. Um, but I, I see it very much that our essence never changes. We are always going to be sort of creative beings. And in the same way when, um, for example, Adobe first came out with certain tools that would help you be able to do graphics and things like that a lot easier, um, people, you know, artists and various um, people felt like they were going to lose their edge and mm. so on and so forth. But what humans always find a way to enhance it and take it to, to an, a, another mm. level. So, I, you know, I, I can see where I see benefits coming in is things like, um, like government, government. Mm -hmm. You know, 2020, 20, by 2030, I know that there's one company that already appointed this AI as its its CEO, right? And they've seen significant growth. Is the AI, um, does it have its own autonomy? No, it's part of a board. Okay. But they see it as the, the, the main decision maker. So the point I'm making is that government and govern, you think how complex it is to govern this country. Hmm. If you had an AI that can work out all the permutations, all the different things and say, you know what, this is the most probable path where everybody can benefit. Benefit, yeah. Right? I just don't think as humans there, there are problems that are bigger than our ability to be able to assess mm. things like weather. You know. Do, you, do, you know, do you know the only problem that I find with that is the ethical the ethical That's side to have our ethics if it's, we're training it's, it's learning from our ethics exactly it's, is that always good though because our ethics aren't always right 
Well, you're you're right, and that's you know that's part of AI safety. That's one of the biggest things in AI right now is how do you curate the information that goes into the AI to make sure that it has the right balances and doesn't have a set of biases. And there are technical ways that you can account for mm. bias, mm. so you can actually see bias and, and account for it. But you're right. I mean, it if it's learning from just doing the accounting. Well, I mean, it's like a it's a, like a formula. I so know. hopefully it's agnostic. But the the, the thing is. If it's training generally, like ChatGPT, where it's just learned generally, read the whole internet yeah, yeah. Off, up to twenty twelve. Well, it's now April twenty two, I think, or mm. twenty three. Uh, 23. Um, there's a lot of good and bad in there, mm -hmm. right? So you know, how do you if you take all the guardrails off ChatGPT that they've already got, and you just you know you just interface with it, you'd probably see some real reflection like you say yeah. the, the dark side as well as the good side yeah. of humanity so i think yeah go on. i think i think we have to trust that the people manning this thing do have good intentions hmm. well so far it would seem like a lot of the people that are involved and a lot of like the turmoil that's happened with sam altman le leaving open ai and you know go going to microsoft and then coming back to open ai and all of this sort of stuff a lot of it is this conflict i mean one of the things that Elon Musk was talking about was the fact that, you know, OpenAI was started by him and a few others, and it was supposed to be for everybody. It's supposed to be a non-profit, and then you know, Microsoft, cut, you know, well, he split from there. They go and get Microsoft to come in. Mm. Microsoft provide the hardware and mm. take a, a relatively controlling interest in it. Mm. Now, you, now you're seeing that whole non-profit structure change because it was supposed to be the non-profit that was in charge of the profit, right. for yeah. profit. Yeah. but somehow the for-profit seems to be having more control Jeez. over the non-profit so, you know, ultimately <laughs> hence, yeah hence, it, it feeds who's, into who's, 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 managing, who's, who's really, really in control that's right yeah um and i you're, you're right humanity's track record the only thing i would say that for example in you know i was watching oppenheimer not the other i need to see it yeah right but it's that the fact that you have a technology that could take apart this world. Mm -hmm. you, humanity managed to get to a point where it was, well, look, you know, we can't allow the proliferation of the raw materials to be able to make these type of man. So in, in, in the end, uh, equilibrium was kind of found. Uh, understood. So hopefully the same will happen. In understood. It. And I, I hope so. And I don't want to be one of them prophets. <laughs> <laughs> um, just given the current climate, of the world with your Israel, Gaza, Russia, Ukraine, Taiwan, China, and think about all the things that are currently happening. And then looking at the, the speed up of AI, one can't help but look at, and I don't want to be pessimistic. Sounds like you're gonna be. Yeah, I don't want to be. And I do see everything that comes into this earth, I think is definitely beneficial. But just given the fact that, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a lack the, of belief in humanity. I, in I, bro, we, we, we are possible. sinful yeah. people, bro. Yeah. 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 No one's righteous, bro. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, I, I don't put trust in man. Yeah. I don't. And I think when humanity decides to be God mm. <laughs> and the creator, actually the creation starts to dictate to the creator mm. how we should function. I think that's when we start getting problems. That's borderline idolatry. Mm. Or we're on the verge of it. We, we are in it. Mm. We have created something that is, in a sense, its own God. Mm. It's omniscient. Mm. It's all-knowing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It knows Every everything. Mm. And it will know everything about you from your facial ID, facial recognition, your cookies on your phone. It knows everything. Let and me throw you something. Please. Yeah, let me throw you something. <laughs> I, rec I recently read an article yeah, where Meta uh, and another company, but mm. Meta in particular, have developed um, technology where they can... Um, put a, a a scanner around your head, mm -hmm. and what if you're looking at something, the AI can tell you without with just the sensors on your head what you're and draw a picture of what you're looking at. So essentially, it's able to read your brain waves. Okay, right. So you you're, you're getting to that stage, and that's because of AI it being able to read all of the the the. the the scans from your brain real time. Right. So if I'm like looking at you guys in here, it will it will draw a podcast room with it won't look exactly like us, 
and it's not going to look exactly like a room, but it knows that I'm here looking at a group of people in a podcast room Mm. without it having to, you know, just with some things on my head. So the thing is, whilst that sounds somewhat sinister, the the upside to something like that is that they're saying AI right now, you're you're utilising it in cancer victims. I'm hearing this. I'm hearing. Actually being able to pinpoint very early. Yeah, I'm hearing, yeah. and, And, you know, the diagnosis yeah. and the yeah. prognosis yeah. Board is good for them. So I'll be so my thing is this everything created has good intent and I just pray that it stays on that path. That is all. I hear you when you talk about the medical stuff. I think that's impactful and I think it's a world breaking it's 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 just it shifts the whole trajectory of how humanity's been functioning up until this point. I think that's incredible mm. and I don't want to take away from that. My only thing is the dependency. That's all. Beyond that, I'm fine with it. Um, I'm thinking in terms of church. Um, when I saw that um, an AI was preaching in a service, I, I don't really? think. Yeah, yeah. You haven't seen this? No, I have not. There's there's a, there's an AI on the screen preaching a service in Germany. Wow, I've not seen that. You gotta send that to me. <laughs> yeah, I need that. I see that. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. And and I'm not I don't know if that will pick up as if if other pastors would be like yeah you know what today we're just gonna watch AI preaching so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that will pick up in society yeah. I don't know if it will because wow. I was looking I was like this is just cringe bro this is I don't was it an actual face it was a face right, yeah okay. it was a face yeah. AI preaching yeah. um, I don't know how charismatic it was I didn't I didn't get to listen to sure, it <laughs> I'm sure that could be arranged <laughs> preaching moments you know I don't know if it yeah. found those those moments to really yeah. connect with the audience but yeah. it's that. The whole point of church is connection. Yeah. It's relationship. Yeah. It's by the love we have for one another. That's how God is seen. And I think the moment that you shift it and bring bots into that, you break the relational aspect. Because I don't know how much relationship I can have with a robot. Mm, it has a soul. You see? But I know how much relationship I can have with a human being. And the whole point of church is God created us in his image so that we reflect relationship. And the way we relate with one another signifies who God is. It's a, sim- it's a symbol of who God is. And I think the moment we implement robots to do God's work mm. is the moment we've lost what the church is about. And I think that is problematic. Hey, cat, cat shaking the head over there. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it's yeah, going to yeah, fall yeah, off yeah. anyway. <laughs> I think that's a good way to, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. Wrap, wrap up yeah. that conversation. So, yeah. yeah. Look, we're, we're going to have to come back and do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just focus straight on AI. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole, whole thing that we yeah. do. Right? And I, it's been a, Thank great, you for yeah. having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thank you, man. Thank you for down here. And, um, you yeah, see what yeah well, 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 that's what we do on the business of church. I'm looking at that camera over there. That's what we do on the business of church for the simple okay. fact we bring interesting people yeah. and um, we discuss life journeys, mm. you know, mm. how business and church, you know, interoperate, operate. Mm. And, um, you know, we're, yeah, we're really, really, yeah, really. Thank you for having there. me. It's been a pleasure being here, yeah, honestly. Yeah. Okay, so it's at that time. Yeah. Thanks for your, for your time and make sure you subscribe uh, and join us on all the social media um, that will be linked to the bottom of this video mm-hmm. share share like and all of that good stuff absolutely take care